welcome back to another Facebook Live event where we continue Adventures Aloud. Today's book is set on the Morris Canal. So this canal operated, it opened in 1831, and it ran for 102 miles across the state of New Jersey. So let's join our Josiah White II canoe, um, canal boat crew member, Doug Milne, as he reads for us a full hand. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Mill. I work on the Josiah White II Canal Boat at the National Canal Museum at Hugh Moore Park. I'm going to be reading A Full Hand today by Thomas Yazerski. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to the Johnson family who donated this book uh, for our use today. Uh, this book is inscribed to the Johnson family. May your towpath lead to a good day's work and a couple of bowls of stew, which the explanation of will be self-evident as we go through the story. Uh, there's an introduction that I'm going to read that explains a little bit about canals and the use of them. The foreword says, canals were the highways of 19th century America. Mules could pull a heavy load on a boat much faster than horses pulling a wagon over dirt roads. Canal boats hauled everything from oats to iron ore through America's wilderness. The canal in this story was inspired by the Morris Canal, which was built mainly to carry coal from Pennsylvania to the harbors of New York and New Jersey, where it could be sold for fuel. The canal stretched over 100 miles across New Jersey from Phillipsburg to Jersey City. It climbed mountains and crossed rivers using inventions like locks, inclined planes, and aqueducts. A Morris canal boat was about 10 feet wide and 90 feet long. It could be separated onto two sec into two sections when it had to be filled or go over the top of a hill. There was a stove on deck for cooking and a cabin inside the boat for sleeping. Boatmen sometimes had to live far from home for months at a time. Two mules would pull the boat using a long rope or tow line attached to the towing post on the boat. They followed a dirt walkway or tow path next to the canal. The captain steered the boat by moving a handle or tiller back and forth. The mule driver stayed with the mules to keep them moving. By 1900, trains had taken over almost all the work of the Morris Canal and the waterway was soon abandoned. Remains of it still exist here and there but most of the canal has disappeared. Our story begins at the home of our captain and our hero. If I can, am I getting this right? There we go. One fall evening, Asa was skipping stones on the canal when his mother and father came down from the house. Asa, my mule driver quit today, his father said. Tomorrow I need you to help me out. Asa's father was captain of his own canal boat. Folks called him the captain because he was on his boat for weeks at a time, working hard for his family. Asa knew a few things about the canal, but he had yet to take a trip. He was only nine after all. How can I help? Asa asked. I'll show you tomorrow, his father said. Let's get you packed and ready for bed, his mother said. You'll need plenty of rest to make your first full hand. The next morning, Asa's mother called from the kitchen. Asa, time to wake up. It was still dark, but Asa could smell coffee brewing and bread baking. When he remembered it was going to be his first day on the canal, he shivered. He wasn't sure if he was cold or afraid. He pulled on his clothes and went downstairs. Come and feed the mules with me, Asa, the captain said. We can eat after they do, uh, sorry, we can eat after they do. Yes, sir, Asa said. They walked to the stable where Asa scooped oats into the feed bags. The captain lifted the bags over the mules' heads. Then Asa and his father headed back to the house to eat a couple of bowls of oatmeal themselves. There's Asa coming downstairs first thing in the morning and his father calling for his help so he can go and help and feed the mules. After breakfast, the captain said, 
Let's get a move on. We have to pick up our load at the coal chutes and get it to Jersey City in five days. Asa's mother walked with them to the boat. She took Asa aside. You know, Asa, she said quietly, your father was a mule driver once too. Though you'd never guess it, you're gonna do just fine. She hugged him tightly, Asa smiled and hugged her back. The captain tied one end of the tow line to the mule's harnesses. He tied the other end to a, a towing post on the deck. Asa, he said, your job is to lead the mules, just like when you do when you take them to the stable. Keep them moving. Don't let them stray off the towpath or they'll drag the boat into the bank. All of a sudden, the mules looked awfully big to Asa. There's Asa getting ready to take his trip down the towpath. The captain took his place by the tiller at the back of the boat. Ready, he called. Ready, Asa answered, doing his best to sound ready. Walk on, the captain commanded. The mules leaned forward and the tow line sprang straight. The boat creaked to life. The captain pushed the tiller to the right to steer the boat into the middle of the canal. Asa walked with the mules, his hand holding the harness, but the animals already knew what to do. Their hooves clapped softly on the ground and the water rippled past the boat. See you in a couple of weeks, called Asa's mother. And there we have Asa leading the mules and the boat. At the coal chutes, trains whistled and clanged. Men yelled and coal roared into wooden hulls. Asa was thrilled. Stay here and hold on to the mules while I fill the boat, the captain shouted. Asa halted the mules and the captain untied the tow line from the boat. Asa watched him guide the boat to the chutes with a pike pole. Dock workers helped his father unhinge the two sections of the boat so they could both fill, uh, so they could fill both halves at a time. When the sections were lined up, coal poured out of railroad cars, down the chutes, and into the sections. The dock workers moved the chutes back and forth to fill the sections evenly. When they were full, the captain hinged them together again and pushed the boat back to Asa and the mules. Asa threw the tow line to him as hard as he could. Good throw, said the captain. He tied it to the towing post on the boat, and they were on their way. And we're, here we have various canal boats waiting and others already tied up and being loaded at the coal chutes. Each section being filled evenly so that the boat doesn't become overburdened on one end or the other. After a couple of hours, Asa settled into the mule's easy pace. They passed a cornfield and one mule started to wander off the path. Asa yelled, come on, you had breakfast. She swished her tail and knocked Asa's hat off. You have to show him who's boss, Asa, the captain said, laughing. Let's go, we have to keep moving, Asa scolded, grabbing the lead mule by the bit. The captain lifted a big conch shell to his mouth and blew on it like a horn. Asa was startled by its loud wail. What's that for, he asked. There's a lock ahead, said the captain. I have to signal the lock tender that we're coming. The next part of the canal is higher than the part we're on now. The lock will lift the boat to the next higher level. And here are Asa and the mules walking past a cornfield and dad getting ready to blow his conch shell. The canal flowed into the lock through a set of miter gates like doors. The captain untied the tow line and let the boat coast through the gates. The lock tender tied a rope from the boat to a snubbing post and the boat squeaked to a stop. Children ran up to watch the boat go through the lock. Stand, Asa ordered the mules and they stopped. Morning, Mrs. Daly, the captain said, tipping his hat. How's the finest baker and lock tender in Warren County? Mrs. Daly laughed. I'm fine. I see you have a new mule driver today. You must be Asa. 
Yes, ma'am, Asa said. Well, I sure am pleased to meet you, said Mrs. Daly, as she turned a crank above the miter gates to close them. I've heard a lot about you. Here's the boat entering the lock. And Mrs. Daly in place and Asa and his father watching as the water rises to take the boat from the lower lock up to the level of the higher lock. Then Mrs. Daly walked to the other end of the lock. She opened paddle gates to fill the lock with water. Asa watched the boat rise up until it was as high as the upper level of the canal. Boy, Asa exclaimed, that's some trick, ma'am. Mrs. Daly smiled. Captain, how about you take along a pumpkin pie for your new driver, she asked. Well, how can we turn down an offer like that, the captain said. Thank you. Mrs. Daly's daughter brought them a pie. While the captain tied the tow line to the towing post, Mrs. Daly pushed the huge drop gate down so the boat could float over it. Asa yelled, walk on, and the mules pulled the boat out of the lock and away. And uh, here we have a pie being presented. And Asa getting ready to move along with the mules pulling the boat. The boat wound through fields and forests. They even crossed a stream on an aqueduct, which was a bridge with the canal built right into it. Asa kept the mules moving with a word or just a pat of his hand. The captain called, I see they're not giving you much trouble anymore. Oh, they're all right, Asa answered. He smiled to himself. Up ahead, the canal seemed to end at the foot of a high hill. And here we have the boat going over an aqueduct, which is a man-made passage for water that would otherwise flow downhill. This is an inclined plane, said the captain, and we're going up. Asa couldn't imagine how. He saw a cradle car in the water at the bottom of the hill. The captain floated the boat onto it and then leaped off. Inside a tower, the plane tender opened a door to let water from the canal through a flume. The, water, the rushing water turned a wheel, and the wheel pulled a cable connected to the cradle car. Asa and the captain climbed the plane together with the mules. They ate pieces of pumpkin pie as the countryside fell around them. I bet all the other kids are just playing tag and checkers today, Asa said. The captain put a hand on Asa's shoulder. At the top of the hill, the cradle car splashed into the canal again. The captain jumped aboard and tied the tow line. Asa prodded the mules and they pulled the boat off the car. And here we have, oops, sorry, the inclined plane with the boat at the bottom going into the cradle car and being pulled by cables that are powered by water all the way up the hill to the next section of canal. Late in the afternoon, a breeze picked up. The mule's ears twitched. Asa turned around and saw the angriest black clouds he had ever seen. A deep roll of thunder shook the air. The captain turned and saw the clouds too. Hold tight, he shouted. Suddenly a shimmering wall of rain fell and almost immediately Asa was soaked through. Lightning struck a tree and the mules reared up in fright. They screamed and kicked and tried to get away. There's the storm coming. And Asa looking out to see the clouds coming over the hill. No, cried Asa, stay on the path, stay on the path. He grabbed the reins, but the mules just dragged them along. They tugged the boat closer and closer to the bank. Hang on, the captain yelled. He thrust the pike pole into the canal floor and vaulted to the towpath, just in time to yank Asa out of the way of the thrashing mules. He hurried to unhitch the tow line from the harnesses, but it was too late. Crash! The boat hit the rocks along the side of the canal. Snap! The tow line broke. The mules kicked wildly. One kick caught the captain's leg, sending him stumbling and sliding into the flooding canal. Here we have disaster waiting to happen.
Frightened, Asus searched the canal for his father. All he could see through the curtains of rain was the crippled boat drifting backward on the current. Lightning flashed again, and he saw that the captain was caught in the rushing water. Asa felt helpless, but then he remembered the pike pole. Scrambling through the mud, he found it and raced downstream faster than the current. When he passed his father, Asa threw himself to the ground and stretched the pole over the water. The captain grabbed it as he floated past. Asa put his weight put all of his weight on the pole and the captain pulled himself out of the canal. There we have Asa running to rescue his father. Asa and the captain sat on the bank. The storm cloud drifted away, leaving a muddy mess behind. The boat was smashed and wedged on into the bank. The mules had fled. The storm nearly got the best of us, the captain said. That was something else when you vaulted off the boat, Asa said. You were pretty handy with that pole yourself, the captain replied. Shouldn't we go look for the mules or pull the boat out, asked Asa. We can do all that tomorrow. I'm sure the mules found a farm nearby and we're going to need a lot of help fixing the boat. In the meantime, there's a village up ahead where we can get some supper and sleep. Asa helped his father up. The captain leaned on his son as they limped down the towpath. And there's the wrecked boat and Asa and his father trying to decide what they're going to do with the day. I think I'd like to be a captain someday too, Dad. I think you'll be able to do anything you set your mind to, Asa, answered the captain. The tired boatmen came to the inn. They had two bowls of beef stew apiece. Then they went to bed. Before the sun rose on the canal again, Asa and the captain had already started a new day. Well, that's the end of our story. I hope you've enjoyed uh, today's Tales of the Topaz. Uh, I have a picture to show you. Here we go. If you come and join us this summer, once we've reopened, the original piece of artwork that appears in this book uh, will be part of our display where creativity flows two centuries of art inspired by our canals. We'd like to thank Mr. Yazerski, Thomas Yazerski, for his lovely work and the Johnson family for loaning us this book. Though it is no longer in print, you can find used copies of it online, or you can visit the Breadlock Park on Route 57 in Stewartsville, New Jersey, where the illustrations of this book make up a storyboard that you can follow from one sign to another as you learn the history of the canal. Thanks for joining us today. Again, I'm Doug Milne, and uh, I hope you've had a nice time. Take care. Thank you so much, Doug. That was a great reading. It was a fun story. Um, we thank you for being with us once again. And if you have any questions, we would love to have your questions um, answered. So you can ask either myself or Doug. Um, he has uh, several years worth of experience of working on the Josiah White. And then we'll be happy to try and answer some of those. I don't know, um, we have some favorite fans, Lincoln and Carter, who are always watching us. And so I wanted to say good morning to Lincoln and Carter. Um, they love our mules, Hank and George. So Doug, I have a question for you. Have you ever been on a rainstorm when you have been working on the canal? I have, uh, both on board the boat um, and as a mule tender because all of us on the boat crew rotate jobs throughout the day, so we all stay familiar with all parts of the job. Um, the nice thing about our canal boat is that unlike the canal boats that uh, Asa and his father and various others worked on, ours has a canvas over the top of it. So if it rains, our passengers are dry and they're comfortable and they're not really inconvenienced too much by the rain. If you're walking the mules though, and the rain gets heavy, well, that can get interesting. Uh, the, the, the towpath can get a bit muddy. You very definitely get wet. And while we do have slickers that we can use, we're not always 
absolutely prepared for the fact that rain is coming. And there have been times when I've gone walking without a slicker and I've come home pretty wet. You dry out over time and uh, you, know, you make do. There you go, thank you. Um, there's another question. What is the most exciting thing that has happened to you while you've been on the Josiah White too? Oh, can I tell the runaway story? <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads into another question. Have you ever had to catch the mules when they tried to escape? <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> so probably the most exciting thing and maybe scary thing that happened because our mules weigh 1,100 pounds a piece. So together they weigh a ton. Uh, one day, our lead mule, George, managed to somehow step through the traces that attached him to Hank, the mule that walks behind. Uh, he got a little confused and he got a little upset and he started trying to maneuver to get his foot back where it could be, but without help, he couldn't lift his leg high enough to get over the trace. He started to move off the path and before we knew what he was doing, he had gone from moving a little bit to walking a little bit to trying to run. The towpath was about to come tight and it was gonna pull the boat into the bank. Um, thinking quickly, my partner Steve managed to grab onto the rope that, that hung from the harnesses for George, our lead mule. I managed to disconnect the tow rope from the back of the tow uh, harness on the back of the mule so that the boat would stay still in the water. And we had to chase the mules down. Well, they were headed straight into the park. The night before, a couple of hundred bicycle riders had arrived in the park and had arranged with the park to set up small tents all over the park. They covered every bit of grass there was available and all of those tents were directly in front of the mules as they ran away. And they were so panicked that the mules weren't listening to verbal commands. We shouted no, we shouted stop, the mules were having none of it because mules sometimes will do what they wanted to do. So Steve is hanging onto the rope on the one horse. I'm dashing after them, trying to make sure that they don't run over people in their tents and their bicycle riders standing around talking, not aware of what's coming. Luckily, I managed to get in front of the mules fast enough that I could act as a visual cue to the lead mule, not to run me over, but to stop. Once I got in front of him, if you tap him on the nose a little bit, they'll sort of pay attention. And uh, George pulled up short, Hank pulled up short behind him. The two of them just sort of stood there looking at us. And while they were a little reluctant, they let us lead them back to the towpath, get them lined up, put the tow line back on the boat and get back underway. We definitely had a couple of minutes there where we were a little concerned that somebody, including maybe us, was gonna get run over. But happily, that didn't happen. That, that certainly is exciting, and um, fortunately, uh, George and Hank, for the most part, do know their jobs, and they do their jobs very well, and they're, um, for the most part, usually really well behaved about doing their jobs, but occasionally things do happen. Um, in the case of the book, there was a lightning strike, and um, sometimes uh, helicopters and things fly over. We've had a few instances where, you know, the mules are just kind of like, oh, what's that? And, and they have a lot of self-preservation. So, but um, most of the time they are just really well behaved and, and we get to do um, the job that we normally do and everybody has a great ride on the boat. So, any other questions? I think that was the, the big topic. Um, so Doug showed the picture once again um, that is going to be in our special exhibition this summer. And that was of lock number seven west. It's known as the bread lock. One of the things that um, was all along the canal is that lock tenders families would do things to earn extra money for their families. So in this instance, this was known as the bread lock. There was a lot of baking that happened um, at that lock and you could purchase or barter for um, baked goods because on the boat you had limited storage and those little stoves didn't really have ovens for them. So some lock tenders baked, some lock tenders tended gardens and that you could get fresh vegetables. Some of them raised chickens and you could barter for that. Um, right in Humor Park, lock number eight was known as a laundry lock. 
And so the lock tender's wife would take in laundry from the boats that went up and down and she had access to river water, which was cleaner than the canal water. And so she was doing laundry and, and you could drop it off and then pick it up three days later. So that's kind of a fun story about our canal on the Lehigh. We wanna thank you for visiting us once again. Um, may I remind you that Next Monday, we will have another Facebook Live event where our captain of the Josiah White Two, uh, Steve, will be reading The Bridge Tender's Boy, which is this book right here. And that's another exciting book. That book is also set on a canal, but it's on the Delaware and Raritan Canal. May I remind you, if you are enjoying our online programming, that there are ways to help support us at the uh, Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor. Right now, we are in the middle of our campaign for resilience. So if you would like to make a donation towards that, we would greatly appreciate it. And always, you can become a member of the DNL. And there's lots of benefits for membership. And if you can go onto our websites, canals.org, or the website for the Delaware and Lehigh National Heritage Corridor. You can see all the benefits there, um, and we hope that you will be joining us. In any case, thanks for coming by today, and we'll see you next Monday. Bye-bye.